This is a day that you have fashioned with your heart. You have established it with your word. And it's full. It's complete. It's whole. There is nothing missing in the day. There is nothing inadequate. There is nothing lacking. We can trust in you. We can rely upon you. We can put our whole hope in you. You are our hope. And we say thank you. And we bless your name. Now tonight I want to go on. This is the last session. And what happened to the two-edged sword of the book of Acts? I cannot tell you how many times I've had people around the world ask me. They'll read the scriptures. They'll, they'll look at it. They'll listen to the testimonies. They'll watch the PowerPoint and everything else. And they'll get to the end. And they'll come to me. And with tears in their eyes, I've had grown men, older men than myself, come to me and say, Brother Dave, why haven't I ever heard this? Why haven't we been preaching this? And especially, you know, a couple weeks ago I talked about Paul. And he says, I am am not guilty of any man's blood. And he talked about the whole counsel of God. And I've had altar calls following that message and seen three, four hundred people come forward. Pastors, leaders. Because they say, we've never done that. We haven't ever done that message. And uh, and sometimes they're a little bit upset. Not at me, but some of their teaching, their training, their background. And so, it's a question that is worth asking. And it's also a question that bears some careful answers. What happened to the two-edged sword of the book of Acts? And When we see this, we understand that the preaching and teaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God was not not a supplemental or secondary tenet of the Christian kingdom communities. It was not something that was added. It was a part of it was the mainstay. It was the principal message and set of fruitful guidelines adhered to for many years. It was not something that was added. Now we have established repeatedly that the gospel of the kingdom of God was the mainstay of the Genesis kingdom communities. In the last 10 months I've been teaching, that's all I've been teaching for 10 months, from whether it was the words of Jesus or the prophets or wherever it was, and for the last quarter we've been looking at the book of Acts talking about the message of the kingdom of God and those things pertaining to Jesus. So I probably feel like a broken record to some of you, but I believe that whether it's Philip in Antioch in Acts chapter 8, verses 4 to 8, when he's preaching and there's signs and wonders, and then it says in Acts chapter 8, verses, uh, verse 12, Acts 8. Somebody read Acts 8, verse 12. I know it's been a while since we read that, but somebody just read that nice and loudly. In fact, why don't we read Acts 8, 4 to 8, and then Acts 12. Acts 8, 4 to 8, and then Acts 8, 12. Anyone? I'll read 4 to 8. Yes. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. For the crowd, when the crowd heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was a great joy in that city. Citywide joy. And what is verse? What does your verse twelve say? They believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. Amen. So what we see, again, I've gone through it. I don't want to reiterate all this. I just know that for the last uh, several weeks we've been going through this. And we witness over and over again the testimony of the two-edged sword. Now, Historically, the gospel of the kingdom of God appears to have been literally replaced 
during the last part of the third century. And I believe it was diluted and distorted with pluralistic mythologies of both Romans and Greeks being synchronized with the doctrines of pagan demons. Now, we, we read a couple weeks ago when we were talking about the origination of violence against the Jews and violence against the church. And I brought you to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. Chapter 12 and verse 12. And it says there, when the dragon of Revelation 12, 12 was unable to overcome or stop the forward progress of the message and the method of the Genesis kingdom communities, it began to infiltrate and endeavor to destroy the church from within. Now that's an opinion. That's a prophetic opinion. You're free to judge it. Let me state it again. When the dragon of Revelations 12.12 12 was cast down, it says he was filled with wrath. And it says he attacked the woman. And then it says in verse 17, he went to attack the rest, of, to make war with the rest of her children. I believe she's coming against the disciples of Christ, those who have the testimony of Christ, the sufficiency, the adequacy, and the exclusivity of his blood. And so he comes and he's, the, the dragon is totally incapable of stopping the message and the method of the Genesis kingdom communities. When that happened, he wasn't any longer able to stop them. They would come into Philippi and they would pray and an earthquake would take place and the demons that controlled Philippi would lose their control and the land would shake and Doors would open of prisons and prophetically show you what happened in the spirit. Now most people don't teach that, but that earthquake was the loosening of demons who had been controlling that land. And see, the demons of hell could not, could not withstand the forward promotion, the forward progress of the church. And so as a result, instead of competing against the church or confronting the church, it began to infiltrate the church, diluting the church. I think it's interesting. I found this little quote. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out of the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. We say one thing when we're in the box. We come out of the holy corner and the holy people and the holy activities and we go out into the world and we act as, in the same way. We act as though we don't believe. And so an unbelieving world simply finds that unbelieving. I think that's an atrocity, but that's neither here nor there. Let me go on to the destruction of Israel or Jerusalem. <clears throat> the destruction of Jerusalem and the dispersal of the Jewish people in 70 A.D appeared to many Gentile Romanized leaders in the 3rd century to be a fulfillment of various prophecies from the Old Testament and even the words of Jesus, which were recorded in the Gospel. <coughs> when these leaders of the 2nd and 3rd century, primarily the 3rd century, began to look back, and they would look at this one event of the dispersal, and then they would pull together, like the scriptures I mentioned in, in Acts 28, 28, they would quote Paul and other people, and they would say, see, this proves it. We are now, we are now the only hope. We are now the new Jerusalem. We are now. And so things started morphing. And by the end, by the end of the first century, the time that John's book was written, the book of Revelation, the message to five of the seven churches, church communities, was to repent. Isn't that interesting? Hadn't even gotten 70 years. Hasn't even gotten a full generation. And the thing that the Spirit of it says to the angel of this church and that church is repent. Revelations 2, 1 to 7, he talks to Ephesus that they had left their first love. A love for Christ was not fervent. 
In Revelations 2, verses 12 to 17, Pergamos. Pergamos had tolerated false teachers, immorality, and idolatry. In Revelations chapter 2, verses 18 to 21, Thyatira tolerated false prophets and cults of idolatry and immorality. Revelations 3, 1 to 6 says, Sardis considered dead and welcomed the spiritually dead into their midst. In Revelations 3, 14 to 21, Laodicea was indifferent, lukewarm, and narcissistic. What do I mean by narcissistic? I don't have any need. I don't need what you've got, God. I'm okay. I've got everything I need. Now tell me that doesn't describe the most of the world. That's a self-worship, narcissistic church. By the second century, the following items were reported among many Christian communities throughout the Roman Empire. There are five areas I want you to note. Number one, we saw a laxity in devotion and dis discipline. Laxity in devotion and discipline. Now, if that sounds if this list sounds familiar to the church today, So be it. Number two, formalization. Formalization of worship liturgy. Three songs, five minutes of testimony, passing of the plate, on and on, seven words whatever, and you're out the door. There was a formalization of worship liturgy. It was no longer worshiping in spirit and truth as a Holy Spirit. How is it, brethren, when you come together, one has a song, one has a hymn, one has a doctrine, one has a revelation, one has a teaching, you all may prophesy, that you all may, that you all may, that you all may. Let everything be done decently in order, but let everything be done. Amen? Number three, Dogmatization. I can't even say dogmatization. Dogmatization. My goodness, who writes this stuff? Dog. I got. Can't even spell it. Dogmatization. Okay. Okay. Of doctrine. We quit listening for the Holy Spirit to give us revelation. We started to encapsulate the word, and she says, that's it. That's all there is. There ain't no more. God, the Holy Spirit, was to lead us into all truth, to the end. But they stopped that. There was number four. There was a worldliness. In uh, ethical standards. Okay. And fourthly, fifthly, fifthly, there was a secularization of daily life. What we have here is the separation of secular and sacred. So now, rather than being disciples of Christ 24-7, we only went to church, and during the time we were in church, that was sacred, but the other times of our life, that was a secular, and I didn't have the same rules. So it goes on and on. It's, it's really quite a, uh, you know, it's, it's very, sta very similar to what we have today. State government and social society standards overshadowed the power of the Holy Spirit and the original hope for a new world order coming quickly. Now, Peter, in his second letter, he wrote to this. He said, some people are saying, where is the coming? Where is the hope of his coming? See, they had, the original church had a hope of a new world order, the kingdom coming quickly. This was the hope of Israel. 
But when it didn't happen, it began to morph. People began to turn it into something it wasn't. This resulted in a hell spawn and tragic precipitation of an evil form of a Christless replacement theology that further distorted and perverted the message of Jesus Christ and the gospel of the kingdom of God. The hope of Israel was the establishment of a messianic kingdom originating in Jerusalem. Please understand that. The hope of Israel that Paul was talking about and was in change for was the establishment of a messianic kingdom originating and operating out of the city of Jerusalem. Is that not our still our hope? Is that Jesus will return and where will he reign and rule from? It's Jerusalem. But that was the early hope. He's not going to rule from Rome. And so, as I want to speak, I want to just add something in here. Let me get those who want that, if you, if you want some more. There's something I call, and I call this the law. There's a law of the kingdom of life called the law of relevance. We spoke to this earlier, a couple, some while, some time back. If something is not relevant to you, you just blow it off. It don't matter. It, well, how does this impact me? What's the so what of it? Who cares? I don't care. It's not relevant. So I don't listen. I don't pay attention. I don't participate. So the law of relevance impacted the church in this way. Those in the West who claim to be Christian move further away from the Hebraic foundation of the claims of Christ as the Jewish Messiah than the expectations of the fulfillment of Jewish writings in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms also decreased. See, they were able to push the Old Testament and say, uh-uh, I don't need that because it's not relevant. I don't celebrate Passover anymore. So the instruction about Passover is irrelevant. I don't need the prophets anymore because the prophet, the last prophet has come. So I don't need all of that other stuff. It's not relevant. So the more they embraced this demonic replacement theology, this Christless thing, the more irrelevant the Jewish writings became. And the greater was the hostility of the a Western church centered in Rome, then moved later to Constantinople under Chris, uh, under uh, Constantinople, no Constantinople under the Emperor Christ, uh, Constantine in 314, and then the Byzantine Empire. It, it's just an atrocity. It's one thing on another on another. Everything had been Romanized with Greek ideology ide, ideologies. I believe it was a a bastardizing the faith by removing the Jewish image of the father. A child without a father is a bastard. And when they show Jesus only as a baby in the arms of Mary, the Roman church has bastardized Jesus by taking away the Jewish father the God of heaven and earth, I am. And they've made Jesus into a bastard. And that's what the world claims. The world says that. The Muslims say that. Others say that. But it's not the fault of the Jews. It's the fault of a demonized church that perverted and abandoned and made irrelevant the Word of God, the Scriptures in the Jewish people. Now, the Greek and Romanized religious culture contended against the Hebraic heritage of the Christian faith. This rapidly eroded and replaced the heart and soul of the Gospel of Jesus with a repugnant counterfeit. The mythologizing 
The mythologizing, yes, this says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. The mythologizing and manipulation of pagan superstitions, such as heaven, hell, purgatory, angels, demons, and the co-redemptrix assessment of Mary's tears, the veneration of relics, bones, and other iconic religious images and experiences blended the purity of the Hebraic understanding of the kingdom of God with mythologies of other cultures and peoples resulting in a mnemonic synchronization of the faith. Now, do I believe in angels? Yes, I do. But I don't believe in these little chubby things that we sometimes see. Do I believe in demons? Yes, I do. But some of those things that have been talked, I do not believe in Dante's Inferno and his description of hell. I don't believe in a Sistine Chapel image of, the, of God touching Abraham or touching Adam. See, all of that is rightly rejected by the Muslim community and by many Jews. Because it's demonic. In Acts 14, 21 to 23, there is an elder plurality without a clergy, laity, caste, class system. Let me give you that scripture. In Acts 14, and verses 21 to 23, Maybe somebody would like to open up their Bibles and read that. Then he asked for them in every community and prayed with fasting. They placed them in the care of the Lord, in whom they had put their trust. Then they passed through this day and came to Pamphylia. Another city. Yeah, thank you. Okay, the point being, is there, what, are you concerned about something? The look on your face, there's something? No, I was talking about this one up here. Ma'am? Okay, the point being is that there was no pastoral class of leaders present in the book of Acts. There is never a singular person at the top of a pyramidic structure. This pyramidic structure came later. It was not established by Jesus. Rather than leaders emerging from among the local congregation, as we see Timothy did in Acts 16, 1-5, they began to be sent from outside organizations. They adapted the priest identity of pagan religions to indoctrinate unrepentant citizens with the, about the historical events of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. In 180 and, and to 330 AD, we see a number of things taking place. Now, all these things I have listed on these charts here. So you can go through here and you can see what I have listed out here as the decline and the restoration of the New Testament church. But in 180 to 130 AD, church and kingdom work began to be rested with appointed clergy. They began to appoint clergy, priests. Sacramentation versus evangelization. The citizens were sacramentized through reli religious ritual and secular ruling and declaration. So an emperor would say, you're all Christian. You who are over here, you're all Christian. They didn't ever hear the name of Jesus, but they've just been declared by a king or an emperor or some other ruler, you're a Christian. Although they've never heard about it. They don't know anything about this Jesus or this Christian faith. So then they would hire people and they would send them to these people, and they would begin to build houses of worship called churches 
rather than people being called churches, and they would begin to gather together people, and they would begin to sacramentize these people by going through these different rituals. That's how it began. People were declared right, uh, Christian by emperors and kings, not by evangelization and conviction of the Holy Spirit. Their righteousness was not in obedience to the Word of God, for they never heard the Word of God. They're like many of our churches today that never hear the Word of God. People who preach whole sermons and never quote a scripture. How can you be found righteous? This continues to plot across the whole earth in deceiving God's people. People seldom encountered Jesus Christ, nor was there any need for a work of the Holy Spirit. Such experiences were mythologized as history. So the whole infilling of the Holy Spirit, the whole encounterability, because now remember, you don't have a Hebraic mindset. You don't have a Hebraic background. You are just sacramentized by a, a, a Greek-Roman mindset, and so there's no encounterability to a living God. Infant, baptize, uh, infant baptism was in 185. They began to baptize infants. Now, I have to tell you that the reason is very admirable. It was because of the infant mortality rate. And people wanted their children to go to heaven. So they just passed a new thing that you can be baptized and called a Christian as a child, as an infant, as a baby, without any faith. You see what kind of door that opens, don't you? You start baptizing infants who can't have no faith at all, and you're claiming that they have access to heaven on that basis. And I am not saying children don't go to heaven if they die early. That's not what I said. But my basis for choosing that would be other scriptures and other mechanisms re relating to the heart and hand of God. But to say someone is accessed into heaven without faith in anything only because they had gotten baptized and now they're going to heaven when they die, that is unscriptural. And another perversion. Official authorized church buildings began to be erected about 230 to um, 250 A.D. We never saw any buildings before then. They met in homes. They met in fields. They met in barns. They met in workplaces. But as soon as they had to start gathering together unrepentant, unknowledgeable people who were now called Christians, they had to begin to have a place. Special people in special places at special times with special activities instead of ordinary people doing everything everywhere all the time. So we began to have a, a separation. We began to develop a different class of people. Now, I really think that one of the greatest travesties of the past several hundred years seems to be our willingness to relinquish the truth of God's Word in such a sweeping manner. We don't want to contend for the Word of God. We don't want to stand up for what God's Word clearly and repeatedly says. We don't want to be alienated. We don't want to be called Jesus freaks. We don't want to be unpopular. Today we can reverse this mockery of the heart of our God by allowing the Holy Spirit to restore our understanding and practice of His gospel to our daily life. Now within a few hundred years of these dates, there arose a great turmoil and conflict between the Church of Asia Minor and the Church of Rome. It focused, it focused on keeping the Jewish God-ordained feast as a part of the Christian faith. There, are, I've got the records. I can, I can hand them out to you. I've got, I've got everything that... Um, hold on just a minute. Let me give you the name. There was a contention between the Polycarp, Polycarp, and Polycrates over Passover. And the Western church said, we're no longer going to celebrate Passover. We're no longer going to celebrate these Jewish feasts. Rather than seeing them as the feast of God, which God set into place, they began to see them as 
Jewish feast. And so they chose the pagan feast of Christmas and Easter and other things. And so they began this conflict. Now, it's really hard to compete against traditions that are 1,800 years old unless the Holy Spirit does the work. In 313 A.D., Constantine, the emperor of Rome, and the, he embraces Christianity and decrees persecution against the Jewish sect of the way to cease throughout the empire. In 354, Augustine and the European church declared there was only one salvation, and that was through the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, now, let me give you that date. 354. That's just a little over 300 years after Jesus is raised from the dead and they were turning the world upside down. A leader said, Augustine, and the European church says you can only be gained salvation as a member of the Roman Catholic Church. So that means if you were a part of the Anglican, uh, not Anglican, the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church or any of the other churches that were a part of things, you were not really saved. In 476, the fall of Rome and the Pope begins to control the kings. Oh, but wait a minute. It was 340. Interesting. And 3, 6, 461, we have the establishment of a Pope. I wondered how the Church of Rome made it so long without a Pope to be the Vicar of Christ. So this perversion grew. Now, pretty soon the Pope begins to crown Charlemagne, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. In 1200 to 1600, the Inquisitions began persecuting and killing dissenters. Now, it wasn't just Jews. It was anybody, any Christian, anybody who didn't agree with them were being killed. The Bible in, in 1299, in 1299, the Bible was outlawed. You weren't allowed to have a Bible. You couldn't own one. 1299, punishable by death. If you were in possession of a Bible... You would be burnt at the stake. What number? 24. 1229. That's in the Bible, native language of the Bible. Before the native language of the Bible is the Bible was, well, we'll figure that out. Anyway. 1999, you're probably right, and this is probably a misprinting uh, on my page. So, you're probably right. And by 19, 1299, the only way to get saved, so I have 1229, Bible's light lot, and then you have to submit to the Pope for salvation. <clears throat> That's how it went. And that's how it's been. And that's what the fight has been for over 1,800 years. We must flee the wrath of God to come on the day of the Lord upon all workers of iniquity and lawlessness. The Lord is returning. We must exert every effort and strength to warn others as well as we determine once again to pursue the kingdom of God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now I believe this is one of the greatest challenges that we face today. Now, I've, some of you are familiar with this. This is from uh, the 10th lesson, if you weren't here. But throughout the world today, throughout the world today, there are several forces that are competing directly at every level against the church. Radical Secularism. 
the removal or reference of consideration of all things sacred and spiritual, believing that all things can be explained through scientific mechanisms. Now, some of you back in Lesson tw uh, 10, I did give a handout on this. Some of you may still have it. I can make that handout available now. Radical secularism. The removal and reference of all and consideration of all things sacred and spiritual, believing that all things can be explained uh, through scientific mechanisms. The opposite of that is religious extremism. The opposite of secularism, but with the unrealistic exclusionary attitude towards other religious considerations, opinions, and options. So we have Muslims that rise up and other groups that say, this is it. If you don't do it our way, we're going to kill you. That's religious extremism. Then you have what I call relative moralism. Relative moralism is a form of synchronistic pluralism lacking any boundary of absolute right or wrong. There is no right or wrong. You can't lay upon somebody else how they want to have sex with another man or with an animal. You can't touch that. You don't have any right to set up boundaries of right or wrong. There is no moral code for humanity. Everything is relative. How many of you have dealt with that? Children, people, friends, brothers, relatives, marketplace. That's what's coming against us. Rabid humanism. I call this an ex exaltation of humanity's physical and intellectual qualities and abilities beyond reasonable historic evidence, being void of sacred and spiritual attributes. We can fix the planet. We can fix the problems. We in the Democratic Party, we can straighten everything out. Oh no, we in the Republican Party, we've got all the answers. See, we don't need God to fix things. We can arise as humans. There is a rabid humanism. These things are perverting, they are polluting, and they are persecuting the heritage, the dignity, the hope of humanity and creation's promise and provision found in Christ Jesus and the kingdom of God. They are using persuasive and pervasive humanistic ideologies and philosophies. I mean, you can't even turn around and you don't see it. It's perverse and it's pervasive. It's everywhere. It's in every commercial. You can't see a Coca-Cola commercial that, that is not promoting homosexuality. You can't go and get an advertisement on, on a certain kind of house insurance without it promoting those who are homosexual living together. You can't, I mean, it's pervasive. It's pervasive. It's in everything you look at. It's, it's persuasive. It's using every argument in the book. It makes it look so wonderful. The fluidity of gender identity and persona with an unfettered acceptance of homosexuality in its many forms reveals a cancer of identity within a culture producing an extreme cognitive dissonance throughout. When what is intuitively known to be truth is continually attacked by persuasive and pervasive action, it results in a crisis of society's intrinsic values and identity. And that's taking place not only in the United States. It's in India. It's in the Philippines. It's in Great Britain. It's in France. It's throughout the world. Because that demon you saw earlier, that dragon, is doing everything he can to destroy the image of God in people. My friends, that's why I believe that now is a time when God wants to restore all and the fullness of everything that He's ever had for us and that the church now in this hour will be the greatest, most awesome church and testimony that has ever been on the earth. Now next week, we will conclude the spring quarter of the Kingdom Exploration Diploma course by looking at what does it mean to be apostolic or an apostle in today's world. I, am so, I have grown so concerned 
over the years because there has been so much talk about apostles in today's church. There are books being written about modern day apostles. People are calling themselves apostles. There are whole denominations in today's church who use the title apostolic and claim to be perpetuating the apostolic truth of the original Genesis church and original apostles. So what is that? What is that? And what does that mean? What does that even mean for us today? We often use words without knowing their original meaning. Where we redefine the words by our experiential filters or personal experience. We use our traditions or our cultural biases and our prejudices to define words. Never going back and looking at what did Jesus mean when he used that word. Most people define the word apostle by the names of those chosen by Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. But he was not the one who invented the word. He's not the one that first used it. It was in common use during those days. What was the word's original definition? What did it mean? And the Lord says to me, he says in, our, in his word, he doesn't say there will be no apostles in the last days. What did he say? He said there would be false apostles. He didn't say there would be no prophets. He said there would be false prophets. He didn't say there would be lying signs and wonders. He said there would be no signs and wonders. He said there would be what? Lying signs and wonders. So if we don't learn how to adequately and completely and accurately define the terms that we're using, people will step forward. There are people today who claim to be Jesus incarnate on the planet. There's a man down in Florida who comes out of uh, Cuba. There's a man, another man, imagine there's two of them in the planet now that I know of. There's one in Davao City, Philippines. They claim to be the Messiah incarnate. But isn't that what Jesus said? Many will come in my name that pretend to be me. If we don't learn how to define some of these things and what is a reasonable expectation, we might be led astray. So next week, I want to conclude this study of the book of Acts by examining the word apostle. And I'll leave you with this. The word apostle is not Hebraic. The word apostle is a uh, Greek, and a, let's use a Latin form of a Greek word. Okay? It's a Latin apostolos. Is the word apostolos. Okay. When Jesus chooses his vanguard leadership team who to lead a revolutionary movement upon the earth, why does he use an oppressor's term to define his leadership, vanguard leadership? Why does he use this word and all the other words in the fivefold? Function identities are all Hebraic. And guess what? There was a Hebraic word he could have used. He could have used a Hebraic word because there was one, and I will show you that. But why does Jesus use the word of the oppressors who everybody hated? What did the people think? What did the disciples think when they heard themselves being called this? What did the other disciples, what did all the people think? Not what do we think. What did they think? What was their reasonable expectation with such a title? We'll come back next week. We're going to go through that. We're going to finish up the uh, spring quarter. And uh, then we'll see what God has to do from there. Amen. Thank you. Lord, I ask you to make your word come alive into the hearts and the minds of people and give us a guardianship over your word. Cause us to study your word. Cause us to hide your word away in our heart and not be deceived, not be led astray. Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us into all truth and have it based upon your word. We thank you, Lord, for that. We bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.